All right, welcome to the last topic in chapter nine on plants. Uh, this video is gonna help you with 9.4, which is all about plant reproduction. Okay, so it's worth noting that there are a whole crap load of ways that plants can reproduce, okay? Sometimes plants uh, are seedless, okay? That they don't produce any seeds, they reproduce asexually by, repro uh, by producing spores. Of the seeded plants, however, okay, there are a couple of ways um, that these plants can present their seeds. We have gymnosperms, which are going to have like cones. So these are like our pine trees, evergreens, etc. Okay, and then we have plants that produce flowers. And this is really what we're looking at here. Now, angiosperms themselves can be split into two broad categories, okay? And we can abbreviate them by saying monocots and dicots. It really stands for uh, monocotyledons and dicotyledons, but that's a really gnarly word to try to spell. So monocots and dicots will do. Okay, so there's several differences between uh, monocots and dicots, and you're going to need to be able to list these and to identify them, okay, based on images. So let's talk about the veins, so those bundles of xylem and phloem tissue. Okay, those veins in monocots run parallel, okay, and in dicots, we have these branched veins, okay? So big difference there. Okay, so since these are all angiosperms, they're all gonna be producing flowers. In monocots, the flowers are in multiples of three. So that could literally be a plant, or sorry, a flower with three petals, or it could have six petals or nine, okay? But multiples of three is what we're looking for there. In dicots, that's gonna be multiples of four or five. Okay, now I know we really haven't talked much about this cotyledon, okay? Um, but just jot this down for now, it'll be important later. In monocots, they're going to have one cotyledon in the seed, okay? That's why we actually get the name mono meaning one, cot referring to the cotyledon. Okay, dicots have two, so that should be easy to remember. So if I'm drawing this, here's my seed coat, okay? Here's my embryo. Okay, and in monocots, there's going to be one cotyledon. All right, in dicots, okay, here's my seed coat, here's my embryo, they're going to have two cotyledons. Okay, the vascular bundles, again, when we say vascular bundles, what we're really talking about are the xylem and phloem tissues. Okay, and their arrangement is a little bit different. Uh, if I take a cross section of the stem, okay, in monocots, they're kind of like spread out all over the place. In dicots, they're arranged in a ring around the periphery of the stem, okay? And so, of course, if we zoom in, and we've talked about this in previous chapters, okay, the xylem is gonna be more medial, closer to the inside, and the phloem, okay, is more uh, close to the outside here. Holy crap, I'm having trouble pointing to that part. You're just gonna have to trust that I know what I'm talking about there, okay? But the arrangement of the vascular bundles, okay, much more organized in these dicot stems. We can also tell monocots and dicots apart by their roots. Okay, so in monocots, we have what we, what's called fibrous roots. So there's no main root. They just all kind of branch out like this. Okay, in dicots, we have a tap root or a main root from which all other roots uh, grow or originate. Okay, so these are all flowering plants and they're going to be uh, producing pollen, which is the male sex cell. If we take that pollen and we stick it under a pretty nifty microscope, we can tell whether or not it's a monocot or dicot by the number of openings. So we'll talk more about pollen later. Let's just jot this down for now. In monocots, the pollen grain has one opening. So again, this one's pretty easy to remember, mono one. Here's the opening right here. Dicots, it'd be nice if they had two openings, but they don't, okay? In dicots, the pollen grain has one, two, three openings. 
Okay, so some common examples that you might be familiar with, okay, for monocots, grasses. So when I think about a blade of grass, I guess I should have drawn that in green. I can picture in my mind these parallel veins, dead giveaway that that's a monocot. Things like lilies, tulips, wheat, corn, these are all monocots. Again, on the corn, we can see these parallel veins, okay, in the leaves here. Dicots include things like roses, daisies, maple trees, apple trees, all kinds of things. Again, the giveaway here is these branching veins. I could also attempt to count the number of flower parts, but that would be dumb. Okay, um, notice over here on this lily, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, again in groupings of three. Over here, this would be in multiples of four or five. Okay, so lots of common examples to pull from there. Okay, so here's the only type of flower that you're gonna need to know how to draw and the label. So we're gonna be drawing a dicotyledonous flower, okay? And it's going to be animal pollinated, uh, which is pretty important because they're gonna have like flashier petals, okay? Um, a couple of different structures that we'll get to later. So I'm gonna start out with the female parts of the flower. And it looks a little something like this, kind of like a vase with a really long stem and a part at the top that looks like this. Okay, so we're gonna go back and label these later. Okay, but for now, okay, there's our basic drawing. Now let's draw the male parts. Okay, the male parts are gonna look like this there may be a couple on each side. Basically some kind of a stalk with a little thing at the tip, okay? We'll talk more about what that is later. Not all flowers have both female and male parts, okay? But we're going to assume that this one does. All right, so then we're going to have our flower petals. And just because I'm not as good at drawing as you are, <laughs> um, I'll do this in a different color. So I'll just say like one, two, three, four. I'm gonna draw four petals here uh, because dicots have them in groups of four or five and counting to five seems hard. Okay, so I've got some petals here. This is going to sit on a receptacle, more on that in a moment. Okay, and then there are these little leaf type structures that kind of originate from the base of the flower. Okay, so let's get to labeling here. So this structure here is called the sepal. More on the functions in a minute. Here is the receptacle. Okay, it's kind of holding up that base of the flower. And of course, these are my petals. Now, the items in red are all reproductive organs of the flower. See, this whole flower business is just basically a billboard to advertise the genitalia of the flowers. Okay, so let's get to labeling that first. All right, I'm gonna do the male part first. Okay, so this entire structure, that includes both this stalk-like feature and the thing at the top. That is called the stamen. Okay, and it is male. And it itself is made of two parts, okay? So we have this bit up at the top called the anther. Okay, and the anther is what's gonna produce the pollen. And then we have this kind of a stalk-like feature that it's sitting on and this is called the filament. Okay, so the stamen, which is this overall structure, has two parts, the anther and the filament, and that is both male. Those are both male. Okay, now let's talk about the female organ, 
this entire structure, I know this is getting a little complicated. Hopefully you're following along here. Okay, this is called the carpal. And in some uh, places you may read um, about the pistol. That's kind of old school, like, I don't know, from when I was your age. Okay, so we would say the pistol and the stamen. Okay, we're gonna call that the carpal. And it's made of three basic structures. We have the stigma, and the stigma is sticky, okay? That's where the pollen is gonna enter. The style, okay, which is this long tube. And then we have the ovary. And I just made a really gnarly mistake. Okay, that you should never be doing. See how these labeling lines are intersecting? That's a no-no. Don't do that on your drawing. So now I'll know if you're listening to me or not. Don't do that, okay? All right, and then all the way down here inside of the ovary, okay, we have another bit called the ovule. Okay, and I'm gonna label that in a different color um, because what I really want you to understand is that the carpal itself, okay, which is again, the female organ of the flower, consists of three parts, okay? The stigma, the style, and the ovary. The anther, sorry, the stamen consists of two parts, the anther and the filament. Okay, the ovule is something else that sits inside of the carpal, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so what are all these things for? Well, that sepal that we labeled, this guy right down here, okay? The sepal is there to protect the developing flower bud. So that flower, before it's mature and it's small, you may notice um, is usually like wrapped up in this leaf-looking structure. That's the sepal, it's there for protection. The petals, these crazy colored, bright, wonderful looking things, are only there to attract pollinators. Like I said, they're like big billboards to advertise the sex organs. Then we have the anther, okay? The anther is this little bit on top of the filaments and it produces the pollen. And a lot of flowers that you might buy from a flower shop, they might cut the anthers off so that the pollen on them doesn't stain the petals. The filament, okay, right here is holding up the anther. And then we get to the female organs, okay? The stigma is this sticky part right up here at the top um, that's gonna catch the pollen. The style, that long tube, is gonna support the stigma. And then down here in the ovaries, uh, this is the site for um, meiosis, okay? Where female sex cells develop. Okay, so this one you should be able to do um, by yourself, okay, if you're really thinking about this. Okay, so meiosis produces haploid gametes, okay? These are our sex cells, okay? So I want you to think about uh, where that happens, okay? Mitosis is for cell uh, division, okay, for growth. Meiosis is for gametes. Which structure um, would that uh, take place? Plants alternate uh, between two different forms at some point during their life cycle. Uh, but you know what? You really don't need to know this. So if you're listening, okay, you can skip this part uh, of your notes. And if you're not listening, have fun drawing this and thinking about these big words because they're not really important to your understanding of this content. Okay, so a plant's life is gonna involve several different stages, and they happen in a really specific order. So first we have germination, okay? So where the seed kind of develops into a full-grown plant, okay? That plant is going to grow, and at some point it's gonna to want to reproduce. Next would come pollination. So this is kind of uh, the release of the pollen and it landing on a female portion of a flower. Then we have fertilization. So just like um, intercourse isn't the same thing as conception, 
pollination isn't the same thing as fertilization. They're two very different steps. Okay, and then we would have seed formation and dispersal. Okay, and of course, if that seed um, was in the proper environment with the right things, it would then germinate. Okay, so let's talk about some of these processes a little bit more in depth. And we're gonna start here with pollination. And pollination is the process where the pollen, which is the male sex cell, is placed on the female stigma. It's not the same thing as fertilization, okay? So um, this is literally just the physical placement of the pollen on the female um, parts of the flower. So this can happen in a variety of ways. Okay, wind, which you're probably familiar with if you are allergic to pollen um, or you get that pollen dust on your car. Animals, okay, which can carry pollen from one flower to another, or even water is a mode of transport for pollen. Now, the flowers of um, plants that rely on different methods of pollination are going to be a little bit different. So if you are a wind-pollinated plant, okay, it's likely that you're going to have small flowers. They're going to be kind of dull looking. They're not going to have a nice smell, okay, but they will stick up a bit from the rest of the plant. Okay, and this kind of makes sense, right? If you're not needing to attract anything, you don't need brightly colored flowers that smell nice, okay? You just need something that's going to be able to stick those male parts out into the wind so the wind can carry that pollen. Animal pollinated plants, on the other hand, okay, have to attract their pollinators. So they're likely to have brightly colored flowers. Maybe they smell nice. Um, well, I shouldn't say they smell nice. They should smell nice to the pollinator. So bees prefer things that are sweet smelling. Okay, flies prefer things that smell like rotting carcasses and such. Okay, so they're just gonna be whatever um, is most attractive to the pollinators that service those plants. Now, regardless of how the plant is pollinated, whether it's wind or animal, okay, there are two types of pollination. Now, you may have noticed that some flowers have both male and female parts, okay? And in that case, we may be getting a little bit of self-pollination. We're also gonna talk about another type of pollination called cross-pollination. So self-pollination is exactly what it sounds like, okay? It's when pollen from the anther of the same plant falls upon its own stigma. So here's a dicotyledonous flower, okay, that has now been put on its side. So the pollen from the male part, that anther, then goes to the stigma of that same plant, okay? And then that is called self-pollination. So the good news is, is that you don't have to rely on any pollinators, okay? Everything is right there, okay? You don't have to wait for some bee to carry your pollen somewhere. The problem is, is that it results in a lot less genetic variation, okay? Because we're not um, combining genes with another individual, Okay, it's the male parts and the female of one flower. Okay, so we're not going to get that genetic variation that's going to um, provide offspring that have a variety of traits that could give them better advantages in their environment. Cross-pollination does result in offspring with that more genetic variation because we're taking pollen from one plant, okay, and it's coming on to the style, or sorry, the stigma of a different plant, okay? Now, it has to be the same species. Remember that these are um, sex cells. These are gametes. So just like you can't have a baby with an alligator, okay, a dandelion can't have a baby with a maple tree. It doesn't work that way. So we're, it still has to be the same species, but different individuals, Okay, um, so this results, like I said, in a lot of genetic variation, but there's always the chance that you're going to have some trouble getting pollen from one plant successfully onto another plant. Maybe the animal pollinators aren't present, or maybe the timing isn't right, or something happens, or maybe this bee decides to take this pollen to a plant of a different species. Who knows? Okay, so it's a little bit more risky, but if it works, um, you can reap the rewards of that genetic variation. 
Okay, so whereas pollination is like the physical act of the pollen landing on the stigma, fertilization is a whole series of steps, okay, um, that results in the female and male sex cells joining to, for a, to form a zygote, okay, so just like in humans. So how's that going to happen? Well, first the pollen grain is going to adhere to the stigma. So that again is part of pollination. So pollination is actually our first step. All right, then the pollen grain germinates and grows into a pollen tube. Okay, so here's the style or the stigma. Here's the style and the ovary. Once that pollination takes place, then that pollen grain is gonna germinate and literally grow a pollen tube that extends down into that style. All right, so um, after the pollen tube grows down into the style, okay, um, there are some uh, cells inside that pollen tube that are going to produce a sperm, okay? So in here somewhere are some sperm. Those sperm are going to be carried to the bottom, okay, through the pollen tube into the ovary. Here, the sperm combine with the egg, okay, and out of that joining, we're then going to get that zygote, okay, that diploid cell. That zygote is going to develop into a seed. We'll talk more about seeds later, okay? Eventually, this ovary is going to mature and swell and become fleshy and sweet, okay? And this is the fruit, okay? And the fruit now surrounds that zygote or seed, and that's why our fruits have seeds in them. Okay, so here's just a lot better drawing of what I just talked about. Okay, so the pollen grain is going to land on the stigma. That's uh, pollination. That grows into a pollen tube, which allows the sperm to travel down here into the ovule or the ovary and combine with some of those eggs, okay, or ovules. And once that happens, we form a zygote. That zygote develops into a seed, okay? And in a lot of cases, that ovary that's surrounding the seed, again, becomes fleshy and sweet and turns into a fruit. Okay, so let's take a look at the inside of a seed, okay? So I'm going to take a seed and I'm going to split it in half. And when we do that, we're going to be able to see the inside of the seed, okay? So here are the two halves, okay, split open, so we're looking at the inside. Now, let's attempt to draw that. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the two halves, okay? So something like this, my seed has been split into two. And on the outside of the seed is a protective coating called the seed coat. We kind of love words that make sense like that, right? Okay, so again, that's on the outside. And we call that the seed coat. Of course, there's not, uh, it can't be that easy. There's another name for it. So seed coat. It's also called the testa. Not Tesla, that's different, testa. Okay. Right here in the middle, we've got uh, a little bit of scar tissue. Wow, that's pretty bad. Okay, and this is called the micropile. We'll talk more about that later. Micropile. And then we've actually got uh, the seed embryo. Okay, so this embryo here, the growing plant, is going to look like this. I'm not going to draw it coming out of the plant, but it's going to look something like this. Okay, so this is going to be the root apex. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, and then we've got kind of what's going to grow into the plant. Okay, that is the shoot apex. Okay, so let's go ahead and label that. This is the shoot apex. 
Okay, and so this is part of the embryo. And then we've got the root apex. You may have heard this uh, term referred to as a radical before. Okay, now both of these make up what we call the embryo. Okay, so here's the embryo. Here's my embryo. The root apex and shoot apex make up the embryo. And then the, all of this stuff in here is what's called a cotyledon. Okay, another term for cotyledon, um, you may have heard it referred to as a seed leaf, okay? Um, now that you're like a grown-up, okay, you can handle the big word. That is a cotyledon. Since this is a dicot, there are two cotyledons. One, two. Okay, so what are all these things for? Well, the testa, or seed coat, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a tough, protective outer layer of those seeds. Got to go through some gnarly stuff um, before they can turn into real plants. So they're often carried by wind or water or fur. They can often be passed through the digestive tracts of animals. Okay, so we need something tough on the outside to protect that um, really tender embryo in there. The cotyledons are seed leaves that store nutrients for the growing embryo. Okay, so this embryo here isn't doing photosynthesis, okay? It's not exposed to light, it's not how it works, okay? It is actually getting all of its energy via cellular respiration. And in order to do cellular respiration, I have to have something that I can burn, like glucose or something like that. The cotyledon, stores all of that energy that the embryo is going to burn off during cellular respiration. All right, the micropyle uh, is a scar at the opening, okay, where the pollen tube entered the ovule. So I kind of think of it as like the belly button of the seed, okay? It's a scar where there used to be a tube extending down in there. And then of course, we have the embryo, which is the root and shoot apex. And this is what's actually going to become the new plant after it germinates. Now, seeds don't just go from um, you know, fertilization to seed to germination right away, okay? First, they have to undergo a maturation process. And this is gonna involve two things, okay? Dehydration, losing a significant amount of water, and going into a dormancy period. So if any of you have ever planted seeds, um, you may have had to soak them in water overnight to soften them up. That's because they're generally dehydrated. The dormancy period means that they're really kind of just hibernating, hanging out, laying low, um, little to no metabolic activity. They don't want to use up all the energy in that cotyledon. Um, and this is to really overcome harsh environmental conditions. Many seeds will have to wait years Okay, in order to encounter the right conditions for germination. Um, some seeds like these often require a fire to kind of pull it out of this dormancy period. Okay, so all the while it's dehydrated and dormant and it's going to wait for just the right time and conditions for germination. All right, so I keep using this word germination. Okay, let's get a definition for that. Germination is the development of the seed into a functional plant. So let's see if we can see what's going on here. It's important that you understand what's happening in this picture. Okay, so the radical or root apex is growing out here, okay? And it's starting to extend down in here. All the while, the embryo that's inside the seed is using the cotyledons for energy. As that plant emerges, okay, it kind of grows out of these cotyledons. You can see how we might call them seed leaves, okay? And now that shoot apex fully appears out of the plant, okay? Now that it has leaves and it can do photosynthesis, it won't need these cotyledons as an energy source anymore. So what do we need for germination? Well, we need a few things. First of all, we need water. Remember those seeds are dehydrated, so we have to rehydrate those dry tissues. We also need an appropriate temperature. A lot of what's happening 
in these stages relies on enzymes. And so we know that enzymes have different activity rates, okay, and diff for different temperatures. Every enzyme is gonna have its own optimal temperature, and so we need to make sure that the seed is at the optimal temperature for the enzymes of those plants. And then I know this seems really strange, but we actually need oxygen. We often don't think about plants needing oxygen. We often think that they need carbon dioxide, but not during seed germination, okay? Um, they're, don't, they're not doing photosynthesis. They don't have any leaves, okay? These guys don't have leaves. Again, they're relying on cellular respiration um, breaking down all the energy in the cotyledons, okay, um, to form their cell tissues. And we know that cellular respiration, okay, we need some kind of a substrate, like maybe glucose and oxygen. And then we can take the chemical energy in that substrate, break it down into ATP and heat, and that produces carbon dioxide and water, holy crap, this is messy, um, as byproducts, okay? But what that means is that we really need oxygen for this process. So we, if you're planting plants, you want to put them in soil um, that isn't too tightly packed because we need oxygen to make its way down to the soil and to the plant. Okay, so thinking about what we just said, um, you're on your own for this one. Okay, I want you to explain why light isn't necessary for germination. Um, I just germinated a bunch of seeds um, for class this week, and I put them in the dark, and they did just fine. So I want you to tell me uh, how I was able to do that. Okay, do you remember way back when, when I told you that auxin was the only plant hormone you needed to know? Yeah, I was kind of lying to you. There's actually another one, okay? And that hormone has a funny name. It's called gibberlin, okay? And gibberlin is a home or is a hormone that's really only functional um, during the germination process. You see, these cotyledons are full of starch, or if you want to be fancy, you can call it amylose. Okay, now to break down that amylose, I need the enzyme called amylase. Amylase is going to break starch down into maltose. Okay, now in order for a plant to produce amylase, I need gibberlin. Okay, so gibberlin produces amylase. Okay, amylase breaks that starch down into maltose. That maltose is then further broken down into glucose, where it can be used for cell respiration for this growing embryo. Okay, so the growing embryo needs to do cell respiration. In order to do that, we have to turn the starch that's in the cotyledon into sugars. To turn starch into sugars, I need amylase. And to get amylase, I have to start with the hormone giverlin. So if you're planting seeds at home, you can actually buy this hormone gibberlin. It will help to speed up that germination process for you. Okay, so in some plants, we see only one seed per plant, like an avocado, let's say. But most plants produce a whole crap load of seeds, hundreds of seeds. And the reason why is because these seeds have a relatively low uh, probability or a low chance of ever getting to develop into a full-grown reproductive plant, okay? Everything has to be just perfect. The environmental conditions, where they land, lack of competition, plenty of resources. So they're really producing so many seeds to increase the chances that at least one of these seeds or their offspring is going to survive uh, and grow to adulthood, okay? So it's really more of a method of ensuring that the likelihood of their genes being passed along increases. 
All right, so we've been talking a lot about flowers, but one of the things that you've probably noticed about flowers is that they appear at different times of the year. And that is something that we call photoperiodism. So photo meaning light, okay, and period meaning time, okay? So it's a plant's response to light. Um, and when we say light, we mean specifically the lengths of days and nights. So different locations have different number of daylight hours at different times of the year. And plants are really clever at responding to those differences in daylight hours. Now, who cares? Why don't they just bloom when they're ready? Why don't they just bloom uh, all throughout the year? Well, we have to remember that the purpose of a flower is to attract pollinators. So if pollinators aren't around when their flowers are blooming, it really defeats the purpose of having that flower to begin with, okay? So photoperiodism is going to ensure that the flowers are gonna be produced when the pollinators are available, and in general, when the environmental conditions are favorable. So since different flowers have different pollinators, it's advantageous for them to bloom at different times. Okay, now we can kind of split up these flowering plants in terms of um, how they respond to daylight and nighttime hours. And so at first we have what's called a long day plant. So this is going to be something like a spinach, Okay, a lettuce, radishes, they flower when the days are long and the nights are short. So I have to say, I'm not particularly keen on how they named these things because what actually controls the flowering is the length of the night, not the length of the day. So we're just gonna have to kind of remember to work backwards here, that if the daylight hours are long, that must mean that the nights are short. Okay, then we have short day plants, okay? These are gonna flower when the days are a lot shorter, okay? So you may notice that in like spring, late summer, fall, um, the daylight hours are getting fewer and fewer and fewer. And so what that means is that the nights are longer, okay? So the night is longer, less daylight hours. I promise that says night. And these are things like our poinsettias. All right. And then finally, we have day neutral plants, okay? So these are gonna flower um, regardless of day length. These are gonna be things like roses, dandelions, tomatoes, things like that. Um, and they don't really have a preference on the day length. Okay, back in the last chapter, we said that one of the things that can influence uh, plant growth are receptors. Okay, and so now we need to talk about some of these receptors. Uh, in this part, we're going to talk about something called a phytochrome. So we know chrome means color, phyto means light. Okay, this is a blue green pigment that's found in plants, and its job is to actually sense the amount of red light. So, you know what, we may want to add that here. Okay, it can sense. Is that how you spell sense? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> it can actually sense red light. Okay. It comes in two forms. And uh, this screencasting program is really kind of bothering me on the way that it writes these. Okay. It should be P subscript R and then P subscript FR. Okay. This is the inactive form of this uh, receptor. And this is the active form. Now, inactive can turn to active, active can turn back into inactive, okay? They're just different forms of that phytochrome. Okay, now when light is plentiful, okay? So daylight, super intense, okay? This inactive form is going to transform into the active form but then it's also going to rapidly transform back into the inactive form, okay? So when light is plentiful, we get this, what we call rapid conversion, okay? This converts to that, but then it also rapidly converts back to this other form. 
When it's dark outside, oh my God, I have no plan how to draw the moon here. Moon, stars, okay, I, think, I hope you know what I'm talking about here. Okay, when it's dark outside, this conversion happens a lot more slowly, okay? Now, more on that in a minute. Just for now, you need to know about rapid conversion in the light and less rapid conversion in the dark. This thing right here, okay, is what actually controls the flowering. So it can either trigger or inhibit it. I know it's a little confusing. Um, this is the controlling factor for flowering, okay, and how much of it is left at the end of a night, okay, can really influence the blooming of a plant. Okay, so let's see if we can draw this out. So we have our inactive form and we have our active form. And our active form, remember, this is what actually controls the flowering. Okay, in the daylight, so plenty of days, okay, this conversion from the inactive to the active form is a very rapid conversion. But it also rapidly converts back, okay? All right, at night, on the other hand, okay, this conversion is very slow, okay? So let's think of so let's think about this. Okay, so if I have, oh, let's pick another color. If I have a long day, that equals a short night, okay? So this period is really short, and since it's slowly converting back this way, I'm probably still going to have some of this left, okay? So when this starts the night, it is slowly converting back to this form. Well, if the night is really short, I'm probably still gonna have some of the active form left. So that active form, I swear that's an F, is left over at the end of the night. Okay, I have no idea where I'm going to write this next bit. Okay, I guess up here. Okay, if I have a short day, that means I have a long night. Okay, if I have a long night, even though this is slow, that means that this is going to have all the time it needs to convert back into this form, okay? So again, even though this is slow, because the night is long, this has enough time to completely convert back this way. So this would mean I have no, uh, no molecules of the active form left at the end of the night. Holy crap, I hope you can read that. <laughs> Okay, so here comes the slightly confusing part. In long day plants, so long day equals a short night. Remember, that means we do have PFR at the end of the night, okay? This is gonna stimulate flowering, okay? So again, since the night is short, we still have some PFR left at the end of the night and the plant flowers, okay? So in long day plants, okay, that's gonna be, um, again, like those radishes, lettuces, etc. They rely on PFR for flowering, it stimulates it, and since I do have some at the end of the night, okay, that's going to make sure that they flower at that time. In short day plants, okay, and remember, short day, means I have a long night, okay? That means I don't have PFR left over at the end of the night, okay? Which is good, okay? Because for these guys, PFR is an inhibitor, okay? So all the PFR is gone, 
okay, by the end of that long night. And that means that I have nothing to inhibit the flowers, okay? So for them, uh, it's good that it's all gone. And so it's really the length of the night, not the length of the day, that determines when those plants are flowering. Okay, so we're going to finish up this chapter um, with some nature science discussions. And one of the things that we're hearing a lot about in the news these days are bees, okay? Bees have somehow become like the rock stars of the um, science news section on these websites. Man, you can really tell how nerdy I am. Okay, in recent years, the animal pollinator population, specifically bees, has really taken a hit, okay? We've seen a remarkable reduction uh, in bees. Um, this graph is from the U.S., but this has been uh, very much a global problem. We think that it's mainly due to habitat destruction, um, which could possibly bring along with it vegetation destruction. So if these guys don't have anywhere to live, they can't survive, and then they can't pollinate these plants. There's also a lot of scientists that are potent, uh, investigating uh, possible potential interactions with pesticides and um, genetically modified crops. There's not a lot of firm understanding here, but it's one of the things that we need to recognize in our um, moving forward with GMOs and with cool new pesticides, um, that we need to understand the holistic implications for all of the organisms involved. So we know that losing bees is a bad news bears, okay? We rely on animal pollinators to pollinate plants, and not just plants that look pretty, but plants that we rely on for food crops. Without those pollinators, these food crops cannot reproduce. And I'm not just talking about reproduce to make another individual, but most of what we eat, okay, comes from a fertilized plant. We're talking fruits, seeds, nuts, grains, corn, all of those things are the products of pollination, fertilization, and embryo development. When you eat corn, you're eating the corn embryo. If that corn plant doesn't get pollinated, that embryo doesn't exist, you have nothing to eat. So it's a really big deal for our food crops. So how are we trying to get these uh, bees back? Well, we really have to understand how they got decimated in the first place. And so if we think that their natural habitat destruction has been a major problem, then we need to work on restoring that. Um, but definitely paying attention to these pollinators. It's not just for the sake and happiness and well-being of the bees, but it's also for uh, the future survival and food production for humans. And so that'll do it for chapter 9.4 on reproduction and plants.